Hello, everybody. Uh, Jeff Miller, head of GMAT Instruction at Target Test Prep, back with you guys again. This time, uh, we won't be talking about how to get started with your GMAT studying, but instead, um, I am joined by Mosin, one of our exciting success stories that we've had here. He improved his GMAT score 160 points from a 580 to a 740. So today, uh, we're going to be chatting a bit just about how that experience was. Um, he can be providing or he will be able to provide some tips for you guys who are studying for your GMAT. And, and certainly you can ask myself uh, or most in any questions you have about your experience at the moment. Um, like I said, he improved by 160 points. He scored a 740 on his GMAT. The specific breakdown was a 49 quant, 41 verbal. So a really nice uh, balanced score. And he used target test prep um, we'll get into that more shortly, but I guess uh, where we can start most in is just with a little bit about your background, um, you know, in, in general, so people can get an idea of, of, of your situation specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Of course. Uh, yeah, so my name is Mosin. Um, originally born and raised in Iran, moved to Canada when I was 15. Um, went to Western University in London, Ontario. I studied medical sciences, but growing up, wanted to be a neurosurgeon, but uh, that plan changed <laughs> when I was an undergrad and wanting to explore that path. When I graduated, I, uh, I was in sales, took a sales job, corporate sales, and after that, moved to RevOps, and now I'm currently doing revenue strategy at a tech firm uh, right here in Toronto, Canada. Awesome. And um, you have some business school plans, right? Exactly. And yeah, I'll be starting uh, Kellogg this uh, this August. All right. That's very exciting. I'd, I'd be willing to bet that there's a decent number of you who are looking to apply there. And the good news is, since you're in Toronto, the cold of uh, Chicago <laughs> won't yeah. affect you. So you used to it already. Yeah, no, nothing new. <laughs> exactly. So it's funny because I hear, I hear people talking about weather sometimes with their MBA uh, choices and guess it kind of makes sense. I mean, you do need to feel uh, like the weather is not going to affect you in a negative way. Okay. Like um, yeah. yeah, exactly. So let's, uh, let's jump in. So why don't you talk first and foremost about where you started um, your GMAT journey and, and kind of, because everyone has to start somewhere. It's a very overwhelming feeling, right? When you, when you're finally like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump into it. You go online, you're like, holy crap, there's a lot of information here. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your beginnings in, in your GMAT process? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's been a it's been a while. I started my GMAT journey, I think it was May 2020. Right when the pandemic started, I was like, all right, perfect timing. I want to yeah. go to my MBA, might as well get the GMAT out of the way. But I had I had no idea. Like I couldn't contextualize what GMAT is. And Right. what it's required of me and how I'm, how I'm supposed to get a good uh, good score. So I bought a bunch of books, uh, started just you know, reading them, doing questions, nothing. I didn't have a concrete plan. I was just winging it because that's what I had done for example, through undergrad. And I was like, okay, this this one, this will be the same same story. So yeah, just did the read, read the books, did a couple of questions, the OG guide and um, and the free test on on MBA.com, and I was like, all right, this is it. I'm gonna go write the test. And two three months later, uh, <laughs> I went in, not knowing what a yes. what a beast GMAT GMAT was. Yeah, and I saw the score on the screen of 580. I was like, oh well, here goes my MBA plans. This is the right. not it. I have to I have to make some adjustments. I need to do things differently, clearly. So I remember I got back home that day. It was September, I think, 2020. And I started researching. And I went on GMAT, uh, GMAT Club. I went on Reddit, uh, all different sources. And the one common theme that I, that I found was TTP, was suggested almost everywhere. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a try. Uh, signed up for that $1 trial. And right away, loved, loved the format, loved the structure. 
and you know, I was working full time, was volunteering at a nonprofit. I didn't want to go out there and have to like find a find the topics I need to study for. Right. Love mm-hmm. that how TTP just laid everything out for me. So I studied through TTP for about five six months, an hour a day after work. Um, I'll just go through one module, do questions right. every day. Just kept very consistent with it rather than okay. trying to cram everything in, in a short period of time. Um, right. I was in a rush. So I was like one hour a day for a period. And that's, um, and after that, I just wrote the test and got the 740. Yeah. And we can get into some more details with that. So a couple points that you brought up that I feel are worth expanding on. Huge mistake a lot of people make when they jump into this test. I was no different back in the day. Mm-hmm. You know, most people taking the GMAT have been through some sort of undergraduate university, right? And you're like, okay, well, I've taken tests in college. Like how much different can the GMAT be? Or or let's even expand it. Oh, I've taken, for those in finance, I've taken the Series 7. I've taken the Series 65. How much different can that be? And um, it's different. And so we go in with this feeling of if I just do a little bit of practice, I can knock this thing out and it'll be no issue. And that's exactly what you did. You grabbed a book, you figured, Hey, if I just do a bunch of practice questions, like why can't I be successful? And you kind of learn the hard way. So, you know, anyone listening to this in real time or watching this later, be, be really careful of that. And look, if you're not sure, then take a practice exam and you'll see very quickly like, Oh, wow there's a lot to this test that I wasn't aware of. And one of the other things about the GMAT, and I'm sure you noticed this, uh, Mosin, is that um, there's a ton of content that can actually be tested. And then all of a sudden you get to the GMAT and you're like, whoa, 36 verbal, 31 quant questions. Like that's, you know, it's not a lot of questions. Um, So if you're kind of playing roulette with the topics you know and don't know, then that usually gets exposed on the GMAT. So I imagine like in your first go around, you're like, wow, okay, this is, this is on a different level than, than I anticipated. I mean, probably didn't take you much too long to see that after your first real GMAT. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I really underestimated right. what, I, what I'm dealing with, you know, again, going through undergrad, I was like, how different could it be? And how right. Hard it be? Yeah, right. And in your undergrad, did you have, you know, one of the things that people always lean on is whether or not they had, you know, a lot of uh, math courses in their undergrad or, or more, you know, English based courses or somewhere in between. Did, did you uh, do a lot of math in your undergrad? No, actually uh, had, uh, I like, I did my undergrad in medical science and biology. Mm -hmm. So maybe I took one math course, but growing up, I was always kind of good at math. I did take uh, calculus one and two prior right. to undergrad, but that was the that was the last time I think I t- before GMAT that I had touched yeah. math. But again, at work, I after sales when I did rev ops, that was I was dealing with numbers and analytics. Like my work was kind of analytics uh, involved, and right. that was that was all the exposure I had with math. And okay, yeah. in. And do you recall your your first math score on on that initial GMAT? Was it somewhere in the 30s, high 30s, low 40s? It was 42, 42. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, it's interesting. That's another thing, right? Like, you know, I talked to accountants. We talked about people in computer science, STEM majors, and and a lot of times are engineers where they think they can just lean on those math skills, and they're they're definitely helpful because it means you have a good foundation, but course you always need to learn things in in a gmat like capacity which changes when you start studying for the gmat so it sounds like you kind of took the foundations you had and and you used um ttp to build on those so that's really cool i mean that's something that's really important to understand when you're coming to the process obviously where your starting point is and then strategically um building on that and we can talk about that next you mentioned you followed the study plan of TTP, um, which you liked. You liked having the organization and the, the structure. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Because if you sit down to study and you crack open some book and you're like, what do I do? 
<laughs> yeah, nobody wants that. A long day at work, you come home, you just want to get through your prep, keep your day moving, keep your night moving, keep your morning moving whenever you study. So did you effectively get through the entire uh, target test prep study plan? And, and what was your duration of study uh, using target test prep? Uh, yeah, I think I briefly mentioned it in the intro, but yeah, so I used okay, TTP for about five, six months, an hour a day. Right. I did get through the entire everything that was there because mm -hmm. I was in a rush. I was like, you know, I'll finish everything. Might as well. I'm putting all this time and effort. Might as well get something out of it. Um, right. But yeah, just loved the, the way that it was structured. So my one hour that I could dedicate to studying Right. It was one hour actually on studying. I didn't spend time organizing notes, right. or finding topics or questions to do. It was true one hour of studying. Right. Now, were you – so when you say you didn't complete the whole thing, were you doing more of the chapter readings versus um, the chapter tests, or was it a mixture of both? And if you felt like you had a topic mastered, you moved on? I mean, is that – no, so I did. Have, I did everything. Oh, you did end up completing yeah. the entire. Oh, I oh, good. Yeah, did, oh. Yeah, did, <laughs> I, I completed everything, start to finish. Oh, good. Okay, hour a day for six months. So, yeah, that's a that's a decent amount of time. That's great. And you took all uh, six MBA.com practice exams as well prior to your final GMAT. I yeah, I think I did. Oh, good. Okay, and. Were you trending around your 740 score prior to um, going to the real thing? Do you recall? Uh, mostly, yes. I think it was, yeah, between 720. And the highest I got was probably a 740, actually. Oh, good. 740, 750. But that was, That's... yeah. So I was on uh, going into the test, I was expecting at 720, maybe. Yeah. But when I saw the 740, it was like above my expectations. So right. Was, this is, I know. This is better than I thought. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, in, in that, well, there's a couple of cool points that you just mentioned. One being you exceeded your expectations. So a lot of people say, well, are the GMAT practice exams easier than the real thing? I think a lot of times nerves comes into play when a score drops or maybe you're not actually ready to take the test. So clearly your nerves weren't an issue. Other cool thing is that you completed all of target test prep and then you took it. There are times where students will complete portions of the course. And look, everybody's different. You know, some people have completed three quarters of TTP and have done fine, but you, you did things the way that the course is meant to be done. You did the entire thing from start to finish. You took the practice exams, you were in your range, you took it and you scored well. So for anyone using TTP or thinking of TTP, like, this is a model way to use the course. Yes, everybody's different. There can be tweaks here and there, but in general, uh, what you did was perfect. And then there's something else that you said, which is, you know, people need to understand. It means you, if you're going to Kellogg next year uh, in 2023, that means you probably applied in the fall, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is really cool. You wrapped your GMAT well before you like it sounds like it may be a year in advance more than a year yeah right and how old were you when you were uh if you don't mind me asking when you did your gmat <laughs> do you mind me asking <laughs> oh, was, oh my god slipping my mind uh what is it 2021 well, well, yeah 2020 so like three years ago how old were you i was 27 okay perfect yeah. so uh my <laughs> my point is that do this stuff early. Like I can't stress enough how amazing it is because I work with students. We do private tutoring at Target Test Prep. We're also in pretty good contact with our students, right? But some of the students I tutor, I notice like when they're trying to balance applications and GMAT, it's like they're just always butting heads because – a lot of times you're also working full time. I mean, 99% of the time you have a demanding job where you're dealing with that. And then you're having to deal with your applications and your essays. And then you're having to deal with your GMAT. So if you can wrap your GMAT 
well in advance of applying to or, or having to deal with your applications, it's huge because you kind of just have it in your back pocket. Now, it, it takes some foresight. Like you were perfect. You're like pandemic hit. I've got free time. I'm not doing anything. I'll take the GMAT. Now, I don't think there's going to be a pandemic every three years where you have that opportunity. But at the same time, like if you're like, I know a lot of students, if you're wrapping up college and you have a gap between when college ends and um, when you start a job, for example, and you're still in study mode, as, as we say, you can take the GMAT then. Or just if you're, you know, 26, 27, 25, and you're like, you know what? I'm pretty sure I'm going to go to business school in the next five years. And obviously you have to be somewhat certain and you also have to kind of know where you want to go. My guess is when you were studying for, before you started your prep, you had an idea of the range of scores you were looking for based on where you probably wanted to go to school. Um, so, sorry, can you repeat the question? Well, did you have an idea when you started your GMAT studying yeah. where you wanted to eventually end up at business school, at least a, a range of schools? Yeah, yeah. So I, I had a, I was like, this, if I want to do my MBA, I want to make sure that I, that I go to the States and these are the, the schools that I want to go into. I hadn't done any research on them. Right. Uh, but I had a rough idea of which schools I'm going to apply to. And that's why I was like, okay, if I want to go there, I need 720 at the moment. Right. Yeah. That's huge too. Cause sometimes like I'll talk to students in the conversation as well. I'll do as good as I can do and then I'll figure it all out. But yeah, you don't want that. Cause what if you put in five, six months of studying and you get a 650 and you're like, Oh, well that, that's good enough. And then you finally do get around to your research, realize you want to go to a school like Kellogg and you're like, well, I don't think 650 is really going to cut it. So yeah, that was good. Uh, just having those schools in mind. And yes, it doesn't have to be exact, but if you're starting early, um, understand exactly what, what that score range should be. So yeah, you did, you did a lot of cool things that I actually advise students doing um, a lot. Now, again, I know it's been a little while. Um, target test prep study plan was huge for you. What, what other aspects of the course did you find to be really helpful in, in your preparation and organization as you were kind of moving forward? Yeah, so just thinking about it, I think one thing that really helped me out was, of course, the repetition of questions. Right. In the medium part. But there's also, I think, a review section, review yeah. questions. Yeah, so yeah, I'll fill in those, those blanks. I know it's been a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in the study plan, we have the missions, right? And then at the beginning of every mission, there is a review quiz, a 10 question review quiz on any topic, any question from anything you did prior. Right. Then we also have these larger review tests um, where, you know, like for Quan, it's like a 30, a 31 question test of the previous four chapters, let's say. And then in between, we're having you review your error log, look at your notes and things like that. So I imagine those are the review things that you're you're referring to. Exactly. Those those review questions of the previous chapters. So that way those just kept all the information fresh in my mind. I didn't right. have to go back and review. It was it was there. So as I was going through the chapters, what I had learned for example, module one, module two or three, it was still I could still recall it perfectly and remember the formulas or whatever I needed to remember was there. And I, that was one of the key components, I think, of TTP that helped. Yeah. And, the, and again, that's another great point because we hear from students a lot. How am I going to remember so much stuff, right? So there is a mix of things we're having you do in TTP. And I say, look, in the study plan, we are forcing you to do a lot of review. Now, does it mean that you shouldn't be taking notes, creating your own flashcards, et cetera? Well, no, you can definitely do that. And we have these things called active review sheets. They're these like blank, these PDFs with blank boxes where you can take notes on every lesson. All that's important because it'll allow you to not only study and review, but do it in situations where you're not necessarily sitting down at your desk, at your computer. You're getting in study sessions um when you're on the go 
And that was something big for me when I um, was studying for the GMAT. I just recall I always wanted information in front of me. And that, that includes math. That includes verbal. You can do flashcards for all of that. So did you find beyond like the review tasks that we were giving you that note taking and flashcard use were a big part of your process? Yeah, I, I personally didn't use the flashcards, but I did fill out the those act, active 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 sheet. review sheets. Yeah, active review sheets religiously. So I made sure that. So first, I did I studied each module, and yep. you know those key points that yes, the, the must the must model, knows the must knows. <laughs> it's so I made back. a screenshot of each of those, and so I had the active review sheets. I would read them once, mm -hmm. and then go to the questions, and I would have it. Let's say it was like. Oh wait, what's the formula for this? I would be able to just refer back to that, to that right, right away. So mm -hmm. yeah, that I that's another component that I would that I found beneficial and I use a lot. Yeah, that's key because like if you if you read through that much material and you do that many practice questions and you just count on remembering it, like it's killer. There's too much knowledge to have to to keep in 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 your back pocket. Um, we do have a question about verbal, so um did you practice verbal too i know you completed the course yeah. but maybe you can give some insights into your verbal preparation yeah so verbal was the part that i struggled with the most english is not my first language but that's not an excuse uh <laughs> so yeah i went through the the verbal section as well uh the thing with uh, reading comprehension wasn't available at the time i don't know uh yeah, it was it was uh, being 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 built. Yeah, we have RC now, but yes, at that point okay. we didn't have. Okay, so then yeah, then then it's I used uh, TTP for again, uh, critical reasoning and, and sentence, sentence correction. correction. <laughs> I remember all that. Uh, yeah, I found sentence correction to be a lifesaver, um, especially I know with these little grammars. That, I don't know. I was never thought when I when I learned English it was just what I heard, it was more yeah. conversational. Mm -hmm. Little things of which refers to the noun right before, for example, these I had no idea. Right, how it modifies the Yeah, exactly. Right. So those, those little things that, uh, I mean, killed me on the, my first try. I think I got like a 28 verbal or something, first, first wow. year. Wow. So yeah, that 13 point increase, I mean, I went to TTP for it. The, yep. the little nitty, nitty gritty stuff that I had missed. Um, yeah, but now with the reading comprehension, I think that's that's a full full package. Now. Yeah, and the cool thing about um, about sentence correction and learning it and the way we teach it, you can get pretty like mathematical with sentence correction. I mean, there are very specific rules that, you know, are very cut and dry that you can use. And as you said, and the GMAT is, you know, they're trying to, you know, essentially test you on these things, things that if, if you're right, if you're just using your ear, um, and, and this goes for native English speakers too. Um, a, a lot of people think they can rely on it. The GMAT knows that. So when you do that, what happens is you can usually get to a certain point doing it, but it's a low ceiling, right? You can only get so far because they're purposely giving you stuff in these sentence correction questions that doesn't necessarily sound right. And that's because over the years of how you know we, we talk and speak to people, we don't even realize um, what's right. And it's funny. I remember when I was studying for the GMAT, something that I love to do is do a lot of editing. You know, I think my wife was in school that, at the time, and I would like edit her papers. I'd look at people's emails, and I'd be like, "Oh wow, there's a lot of grammar issues in those emails." So yeah, you learn a lot of like cool stuff that you can kind of use uh, uh, every day. Yeah, just to add on that, actually, I as I was going through the sentence correction, so I would apply what I had learned in the work emails that I would send. Yeah. And I I remember telling my friend at the time, it's like, you know what? Even if I don't go to MBA, I'm happy I took the GMAT. Yeah. That, that critical reasoning and sentence correction just helped me out, not with just emails and just daily life, just the way I think. So, I know. Yeah. It's cool. It's so cool. Like, I, like you know, I, I've... Never like prior to dealing with GMAT, I never thought about fanboys and how they should be used, right? Yeah, exactly. Surprising that I remember that. Right. So, and, and it's one of those things that if you can start using it every day, then it, it literally becomes second nature and it'll never 
never go away. You're going to use that during your MBA and beyond, and you're using it now. So I totally agree. It's, it's super cool, actually, because if you're not studying for the GMAT, why would you ever be in a situation to, you know, hyperanalyze grammar in that way? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's awesome to hear. Now we have a couple other questions. One, one is more of a university question. Why did you choose U.S. universities over Canadian universities? Any particular reason for that? Uh, purely, I was just looking at the the ROI, return on investment, um, and that was one reason. And I, I'm I'm an adventurous guy. I'd like to if I have the opportunity to go live in a different country and experience different culture and network differently. Mm -hmm. I, I would take that. So for example, my undergrad, I was living in Montreal at the time and I chose Western cause that was the, that was kind of far from where I was living. I didn't know anyone going there. So I was like, all right, I'll get to meet new people. And basically same, same philosophy applied it here. I was like, all right, I have an opportunity to go meet new people who, you know, be in a completely new environment, learn about different cultures and so on. Yeah. So that's why I chose um, US over, over like Rotman or anything. Yeah. Makes sense. Did you, did you visit Kellogg at all before? Uh, um, no, no, I didn't. I, um, I did connect with a lot of students Good. From, from Kellogg and love the culture of the, the connection that I made. And, yeah, I, I think sometimes you just get a feeling, right? And, and these, these were like current students and alumni that you, yeah, that, that's always smart. I, I tell people to do that all the time. Um, and you did that prior to applying, right? Yeah, so after I got GMAT out of the way, I was like, all right, now I can focus <laughs> my time on my career and uh, researching schools. So I met with, I went, attended a couple of virtual events, met with alumni in Toronto, um, spoke with students. I did that probably for about a few months, actually, just That's so cool. we'll get a proper feel of, you know, spending two years at this school. This is a place where I want to pull myself where I can really grind and chase after my goals while also having fun. I don't, uh, you know, it's, it's an important part of my life. And no, yeah. Socially, you want to feel like, you, you like know, you th things fit. Um, and the, the other nice thing about doing that, I mean, I don't know how the, if, if this helped any with your admission, but obviously being less than a name on a piece of paper and, ha you know, having a face to you and a personality when you're going through the admissions process, I, I always tell people, you know, networking and getting in front of people is huge. Um, I imagine that probably helped you a little bit with with the application and the process. Uh, in what sense? Well, just so just you know, in the sense of admissions, knowing who you are, and you know, attending events, for example, like yeah. let's say you attended no events and you just applied, right? You could still get in, but I think it's always helpful when they know who you are, at least have an idea of who you are prior to submitting those applications. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I, I don't should sure, like I don't know how they would look at like if they would look at my name after attending an event. But right. I think just from from my own perspective, you know, attending those events will just give me a full view of, you know, this what they offer, what's good about this school, what's not right. good about this school. And yeah, it helps me help me make my decision and write those essays and get the recommendations in a way that portrays with that's tailored to that school. Right. Also yeah. just up to the entire process. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, exactly. So that, that that's great. And that's a little insight for anyone who's going to be applying soon. I, I think all of that is very, very good advice. Um, someone else asked, apart from target test prep, did you use anything else? Any other courses or no? Just uh, TTP. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, we can't stress that enough. People ask that a lot. Hey, do I need X? Do I need Y? Um for a lot of people, uh, you know, like most in here, he just used target test prep and look, we have you do a lot. So going elsewhere is going to usually muddy the waters. Like we have a lot that we know we expect you to do and get done. Um, 
you know, if you need to at the end and use the official guide, sure. If you want extra practice, but is it something that we necessarily say you have to do? No, if we thought you had to do it, it would be in the study plan. So everything that we need from you is in, um, is in the study plan. So, you know, keep that in mind if, if you're currently working through target test prep, um, or if you are, um, you know, thinking of using target test prep, understand that you don't need anything else and you can literally um, just use the course. Um, okay, this is a good question uh, from David. The mindset behind all the hours you put in the course, like you completed the darn thing, you studied daily for an hour over the course of five, six months. Um, so the question is about your um, mindset, I guess, putting in all that time and effort and energy uh, into the course. And then secondarily, he also asked any tips on, on a study strategy. Okay. So I'll go with the first one. It's a really good question. Mindset, so yeah. It's all, it's all about discipline, I guess. Um, I, built, I built discipline through different ways in my life prior to GMAT. So when the time came to actually study for this, I first pictured the end goal. I was like, all right, this is I'm applying for MBA, going to these schools. This is the score that I want. And I laid out the steps for myself. I was like, all right, if I do this for six months, then I'll have this result. So every time that I was going to study it, whether well, I was feeling good, I wasn't feeling, feeling well. And uh, I, I kind of ignored that reminded myself of the, that end goal and yeah. I just pushed through. Obviously there were days that uh, didn't feel great and I uh, needed time off. I did that towards the end. I did feel before writing my test, I felt burnt out. So I mentioned um, because of work and all the studying and everything just added up and I was feeling really burnt out towards the end. And I took a week off uh, uh, yeah, prior to writing my test. Um, so it's about just understanding what your final goal is, where you're going, why you're doing it, it's reminding yourself of that. And if your body's telling you to, to relax and take a break once in a while, just listen to it and do that. It will help you actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we can get to the second question in a second, but man, this is crazy. Like <laughs> everything you just said. I literally say we've written about it. We have a blog on GMAT motivation that I wrote and, and, and almost, it's almost as if you read that and then recited it because uh, I can go through some key points to reiterate because they're awesome. Um, the GMAT is a stressful thing. Some people get to take it at a time in their lives when they have less going on and, and great. Good for you. That's great. I mean, you did it when you didn't have to worry about applications. Some people can take it prior to a job. Some people can take it when they have less, you know, family uh, responsibilities and stuff like that. I notice a lot of my students um, are taking it in their mid twenties when they go through what I like to call wedding season, wedding every weekend, traveling, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, no matter how stressful it gets, understanding why you're doing it in the first place is huge. Because if, if there is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, then like you're going to stop because you're going to say to yourself, why am I putting myself through this? Why am I doing it? So taking time to reflect in those moments when the day is bad and you don't want to open your computer, your book, whatever, huge. Um, discipline is so huge, right? Because how many days did you sit down and you're like, I don't want to do this? I want to do anything else but this. I mean, I'm sure there were many days like that, right? Yeah. Right. But it's, and, yeah, sorry. Well, but, no, no, go ahead. Keep, this is no, even better. It's always just like reminding myself, you know, this is for the greater good. You know, not everything's going to feel great when you're doing it. Right. And that's what gives you the reason not to quit. Mm -hmm. It's like not everything's going to feel great. There are right. We don't feel great, but that's just seeing the light, the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, that's life in, 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 that's in, yeah. in general. Right. And then having the discipline to say, I'm going to fight through this day of studying. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's like going to the gym. If you don't feel like going to the gym and you don't have the best day, but you've done it. Right. Um, so having the discipline, um, and, and I know the next question is about tips on a study strategy, but one thing I'll also mention that I, you know, will say till I'm blue in the face to any student that'll listen and that's create some sort of schedule for yourself, a study schedule, daily study schedule, weekly study schedule, something that in advance you can look at and you can say, well, I'm telling myself that I'm waking up at 6 a.m. to study for an hour, hour and a half before work on this day and I have to do it. Or I'm studying on a Saturday from 9 to 12 because I said I was going to do it. It's in my calendar. I'm going to do it no matter what comes up short of, you know, obviously work responsibilities and, and other things that are high on, on the responsibility scale, but pushing away, you know, say social stuff or, or something like that. Right. So that that's a big thing from my end, but do you have any um, study tips that you can share that helped you outside of what you, you just mentioned? Let me remember. Uh, I think it's very, very personal. I think my biggest, my, the best tip I can give is understand how you learn. Take the time, like, kind of understanding yourself. Um, for example, I learn when I apply what I've learned to a problem right away. I'm not a theoretical person, I'm practical. Right. And what I found, that's the way for me. So I spent a lot of time just doing questions and how I can solve this question. Like last time I solved it in 30 seconds, now I want to solve it in 20. Yep. Just how I can get better and more efficient at it. So I think that was that was it for me. I didn't do anything crazy or anything, you know, that you guys haven't thought of. It was just understanding yourself, how you learn, and uh, applying them, just doing questions and getting better at it. Just measure measure your performance each time. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And you know, one of the things that I think it's great about target test prep and uh, you know, we, we have videos in the course to, to, to problems uh, in our chapters like solution videos. And, you know, it, it's, it's a mostly text-based course. Um, it's not a video course, but we like that because it gives flexibility in, in, in learning um, and having things at your fingertips. You know, when you want to skim, you can skim. When you want to read something deeply, you can read deeply. So how did you find like, that you know the fact that ttp is a written course with some solution videos and that we have a certain level of detail like how did that aid in your learning and in your preparation it helped a lot like i remember doing some questions or like some chapters that i was really struggling with and when i couldn't understand i would just refer back watch the video a couple of times and then try to do it myself and the way for example that you guys had done it through the video i was like oh this is so easy actually i'd never i hadn't thought of this way it was very short very quick but easy to understand mm -hmm. just be able to watch that and then apply it and then i would apply it to other questions similar questions um down the line so yeah overall it came together really really nice and, and did you find like the written nature of the lessons easy to digest because you kind of had full control over, you know, as you read something, you get to choose like how deeply do, do I need to read this to understand it? Or do I skim it and move to the next line? Like, did you like that level of kind of freedom in, in your learning process? Yeah, exactly. Like you mean the must knows and then. Yeah, the exactly. Or just, you know, when we're teaching, instead of having, uh, you know, a 20 minute video, we're teaching you um, through text and explanation um, and that's something that we really, we really like in the course because of the level of detail yeah. that it provides and the flexibility it provides. Yes. I found the text part to be really helpful because again, like I can just take a screenshot, put it in my review sheet and refer back to it. And mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, if it's just video, for example, you would have to skip and in right. that spot. So I'd like, exactly. to, you know, just being able to just refer back to something and be like, okay, you know what? I don't need this detail for example. I'll just take this one. Right. Just having that yeah. control that you can mention, it's, uh, it was very helpful. Yeah. And I tell that to students a lot, especially students who come to us. Now you needed the whole thing because you were in the 500s. You wanted to go to the 700s. I mean, your improvement was massive and you needed a massive improvement. 
But from time to time, a student will come to us with a 690. You know, we offered an ex we do offer an accelerated study plan within TTP. You may have noticed it where you can do the chapter test questions first and then gather the data, read back where you're weak and, and just stick to those readings. But you can also go through the course the way you did and just pick and choose your spots, skim the, the places you need to skim. I mean, if you're at a 690, for example, you probably don't know how need to know how to add and subtract fractions. You probably know how to do it. So if you get to a lesson like that, the cool thing is you can still skim it and see if there's anything that you could pick up on. And if there's not, you keep things moving as opposed to a video on something like that. I mean, I guess you could watch it at a faster speed, but ultimately there's not really the flexibility and control you have where something's written. So I find that to be, you know, really a game changer that allows students of any level to do what they need to do with it. Like it's in your hands now. Do you want to do the whole thing? Do you want to skim part of it? So it, I think it, I think that's why we've been able to help so many students at, at, um, at so many different levels, uh, starting, starting with their GMAT studying. So those are some more points about target test prep. Um, you know, do you, do you have any overall advice for anyone watching this at any point? Like, as, as you said, you've given a lot of insight into your shortcomings when you first started your GMAT studying, what you learned from that, um, and how you, you know, move forward. Like if you could give anyone a top three, top two, or top tip on just in general, like the process as a whole, cause it is overwhelming. Like what, what would that be? Just the advice. I mean, first start early, I'd say I can't, I can't stress this enough. Um, when you start early first, you're more relaxed, not just right. throughout your preparation, but also when you're writing the exam, if you're crunched for time and you're like, okay, I can only write this once. Naturally you're going to be more nervous. Right. And, and but then you relax. Like I was, I showed up to the test center. So I and I'm prepared. Do great, great. If not, I'll write it again. Yeah. And that just helped me calm my nerves a lot. Um, second would be consistency. Um, it's about no. It's not about. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It really okay. is. It's just putting that time, half an hour, an hour every day. For, uh, for a long period. Again, it, it varies on personal right. level. Some, mm -hmm. people, some people may be able to do it during two weeks. Uh, I, yeah, I can't speak for that. But uh, it's understanding, again, how you learn and how what approach you can take, what really makes you have control over over the test and over the study material and so on. And yeah, but just how do you understand GMAT? If you want to take down GMAT, you need to understand how it works. And yeah. if that that whatever time that gives you, gives you the opportunity to do that. And. Oh, that's great. <laughs> no, that's, that's fantastic. I think those, those things are, are, are huge for anyone uh, watching this. I think a lot of people miss all of those things that you just mentioned. So that's really, really, really good advice. And again, like you're saying a lot of the things that, that I say, so uh, that's super cool to hear. Um, so we can run through if there's any final questions anyone has for us. I, there is one question here. Do you think that age really matters while preparing for the test? Um, yeah, I, I think the question may be related to how, I mean, I guess I can answer that, how far you are out of school. I mean, it sounds like you were about 25 when you were preparing, or no, 27 when you were preparing. No, uh, I wrote the test when I was 27. So 26 ish when yeah. you were yeah. right. So I guess that's like four years out of school. Um, I, I don't think age matters. I think it just depends on what you've forgotten from back when you've learned it and, and what your background potentially is with quantum verbal and the GMAT. I don't think there's any age or ceiling on an age where, Oh, I can't prepare for the GMAT because of it. Obviously the younger you are, there's probably advantages to that that I went through in, 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 in this uh, interview today, um, not just from a um, knowledge standpoint, but just from a where you're at in life standpoint and you know your ability to de dedicate more time to this. But 
no, I don't think um, age is an, is an issue at all. Um, another question, and uh, if you want to answer this, Kellogg is known for marketing. Are you going into marketing slash consulting? Uh, I'm going into consulting, but I think the marketing thing is, I mean, they're great for marketing, but they're also great for tech consulting. I think right. the difference between the M7s is very negligible. Right. But, yeah. It, I'm going to consulting now. All right, cool. Um, does anyone have any other uh, questions before we sign off here? Um, I know we've answered them throughout the, the interview today. Um, I don't see any other questions popping up. So I think that's good. I mean, most and again, um, I mean, hey, congrats on, on a really awesome journey. It's super cool doing these interviews when we see where you're attending to, because it's like, it's kind of the, the, you know, the icing on the cake. Uh, you got into a great program. You got a great GMAT score. So, you know, you're proof that if you put in the time, you start the process early and you dedicate yourself, like really, really great things can happen. And, you know, look, if, if you're not in a situation where you started early and like you can still do it too, but just look, he improved, most had improved 140 points. Um, I think I have that right. It's either 140 or 160. I don't want to catch you uh, short on that. Um, 160 points. So got to give you those 20 extra points. And that's awesome. Anyone can do it. You just got to dedicate yourself, be disciplined, and understand that at the end of the day, you can get there too. So Mosin, I really, really appreciate you coming out, spending the time here. Um, people are going to you know, gain a ton from this. And uh, yeah, thanks again. And thank you, everybody, for attending uh, today's interview. Thank you for having me, Jeff. All right. Cool, Mosin. Well, I'm sure we'll be in touch at some point in the future. And thank you, everybody. And uh, have a great day.